Hi, um, I'm here to talk to you about rethinking test automation and I could uh, retitle it or subtitle it as what testers need from machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I'm trying to bring uh, us in the, into the 21st century, let's say. Um, I've got a lot to cover, so I've kind of cut this down a little bit uh, and it's like a one hour talk in 20 minutes. So I'm just going to crash on uh, regardless and hopefully if you've got a question at the end, there'll be time for that, of course. Um, I'm going to talk about... Um, uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence very briefly just to introduce a couple of definitions but then I want to sort of use my new model for testing as a framework uh, as a foundation for understanding how these technologies will help us in the future because if we're going to use tools to help us think well we need to know how we think in the first place and that's what the new model is all about. Um, I want to talk about two topics that are um, underrepresented, let's say, in the uh, literature and also in people's experience. Uh, and I think we need to look a little bit more deeply into what I'll call integration, uh, which I'm sure you understand, but I'm going to go a bit deeper than maybe you've seen before and talk a little bit about test realism, which I think is significant when it comes to uh, having tools make choices for us of uh, tests potentially in the future and test data uh, certainly. Um, and of course, I want to talk about future tools and uh, where I think uh, our future lies in the use of machine learning and AI in the technologies for, in particular, test design and uh, test execution. So firstly, uh, I'm going to give you two definitions very quickly. I'm going to suggest that machine learning uh, represents software agents that make suggestions, uh, that offer suggestions, if you like. And artificial intelligence are software agents that make choices. Now, we may allow computers to make choices or we, we, we may want to approve them before they, the choices are actually made. And we may have an offer of several choices. But anyway, what I want to suggest is, in, in a very simplistic way, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence offer suggestions or they make choices or both. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is this idea of a new model for testing. I've, this has been about for some years, but before I do that, I'm going to uh, just touch upon a couple of models that I'm sure you know and love, or maybe don't love. Uh, and the first one was essentially Brian Marek's uh, four quadrants idea uh, from the early 2000s, and I think. And what Lisa and Janet have done is added some detail about where tests take place and potentially where tools are in use. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, and but I think it's now nine or ten years old, I think, uh, in, the, in the modern format. And what you'll see is if you look uh, on Google and search for this kind of diagram, you'll see hundreds of examples. Uh, every consultant's got their own version nowadays. And um, I'm not, I don't have any view on whether this, is, uh, this model is helpful or not. I think it, it is helpful. But I don't think we've moved on in ten years. That's the problem I've got with it. Now, the other uh, uh, model that's, that's out there uh, in widespread use, it's pervasive, is this uh, test automation pyramid. That is the suggestion that uh, unit tests, component tests represent the bulk of our testing, but also our automated testing, of course. Uh, and the higher up the pyramid you go towards GUI tests, uh, the fewer tests there should be. And, uh, and in principle, this is fine. But I have to say, uh, I'm not as impressed as some people are because... It seems to me that it reflects uh, the thinking of the 1980s. Uh, it is just the right-hand side of the V model, just with a pretty pyramid put on it. So, you know, uh, it has some value, but it's really rather limited and uh, kind of obvious, I think. And if you don't understand this, I think you're in the wrong business almost. So uh, let's move on. Uh, of course, the pyramid is, uh, again, pervasive across the internet, hundreds of versions of the same diagram saying pretty much the same thing. Now, these models, I think they're still relevant, yes, uh, but they're just basic. They're just sort of uh, beginner guides. You know, they're not helping us to solve very many problems, I have to say, because they're kind of obvious. And that's what I my criticism is. And the thing is, we've been living with these diagrams for uh, 10 or 15 years now, and I think we should make some progress on this. Now, what I want to suggest is that in order to make uh, progress in terms of our thinking, we have to uh, remove what I call logistics from our consideration. That is, we need to separate thinking, uh, you know, our thought processes from 
the mechanics, the logistics of how we get things done in testing. So I'm, I'm kind of suggesting that we don't care about what technology we're using, don't care what business you're in, don't care whether you're working in Agile or a continuous delivery or a waterfall environment. These are all logistical choices. Um, so with that in mind, um, this diagram represents the 10 thought processes, uh, I think, uh, that testers um, uh, take take you know take seriously and could apply in any in any context so by removing all the logistical stuff uh, which just gets in the way of our thinking important but it's not part of the testing thought process by removing all that stuff we have a much clearer idea of where our head is at at each moment in time as we think as we work from uh, sources of knowledge which might be requirements uh, or uh, business stories or an interview or a doodle on the whiteboard or it might be the old system which is a source of knowledge it might be the new system which is a source of knowledge too and our inquiries inquiring is all about gathering information from these sources and as we explore which is what we're doing with our sources we build mental models and we might document them but that's a logistical choice the, men the mental model is kind of still there so we build mental models and we use those models to inform our choices. So if our model is something as mundane as a uh, flowchart, we can trace paths and derive tests from a flowchart. It's as simple as that. Now, there are many different ways of modeling our systems. The flowcharts are one. But when we have our tests, we then apply those tests uh, to the system under test. And I don't care whether you run those tests with a human or you run those tests with tools. That's a logistical choice, okay? Now, of course, when you run your tests with tools, you lose the human observer, which has great value, needless to say. But that's a logistical choice. You might choose to have a faster running test, but without the human input or the human observation. Uh, and and the, the arrows which are working from right to left, I wouldn't always call them feedback loops. They are simply where we are revisiting thoughts, where we learn learn something, uh, which makes us think we need to go back one step to maybe reassess our understanding of a requirement or our mental models or our tests themselves. It's a, it's a model of our thought processes. It's not a um, business process to follow with inputs and outputs, uh, entry and exit criteria, all that kind of stuff. It's just 10 modes of thinking we go through as a tester. So, with that in mind, uh, when we look at what test execution automation does for us, and we tend to be lazy and call it test automation, um, that that label misleads because it implies that we're, we're automating everything and that in principle tools can replace testers. And we know that's nonsense. Uh, and the way I explain that nowadays and the way I justify you know, the existence of, of humans in this process is that um, test execution automation is basically where uh, I've got this uh, thought process of applying, applying the test, uh, 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 setting up environments, uh, running, running tests, uh, comparing with expectations, uh, and that's it. That's all test execution tools, tools do for us. They might generate uh, error reports if there's a mismatch, of course. But at the end of the day, uh, test execution tools do part of one of the 10 thought processes. That is, they support one of the thinking activities of testing. So they're not replacement for testers. So I suggest that test automation tools are mechanical tools. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they are, <clears throat> they are not sophisticated and extremely clever uh, pieces of technology, but they're not uh, doing a, such a great, greatly intellectually difficult job. They're doing a very mechanical process, and that's what typically software has done in the past. Machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence is going to introduce much more sophisticated and more nuanced uh, support for, uh, uh, for testers. So I want to summarize, if you like, the, the, the top of the mountain view of, of what tools can do for us and the best they could possibly do with us. And the first level, I'm going to suggest that, that we can integrate uh, tools with uh, test automation. We can actually automate tests. Now, by and large, we know how to do this, uh, whether we're using a, uh, a tool that is a, um, very focused on a programming language or whether uh, the tool is uh, kind of uh, model-driven. Uh, 
I, you know, I would support that very strongly. That's the way we should be going. But uh, integration with automation, that is integration of test automation with uh, our test process, is the easiest thing to do. And that's the low hanging fruit, which has been picked many, for many years. Um, it's almost like a commodity now, I would say. Now, the next level of sophistication would be to look after record keeping. And it's, in, in essence, this is capturing the models upon which our test automation is based. That is, it, our, our test models inform uh, our test selection and design, if you like. So the record keeping is um, not easy, uh, but it's easier, if you like. Um, it's harder than uh, the test execution automation. It's some kind of midpoint. We need to do better record keeping to capture the models that uh, uh, our tests are derived from and reported against. That's the other angle. And the third level, I think, is where tools actually support human thinking. So as we explore a source of knowledge, whether that's the, uh, the old system, the new system, the uh, requirements or user stories or whatever, um, I want tools to support my navigation through, uh, for example, the new system so that I can capture paths, potential paths of execution that can be used in tests, tests but also we'll, we'll, we'll trace a map and generate the model, if you like, the roadmap of paths through the system. And, and that would be shared across my team. So my team know where other testers have been, that is. So, um, for example, and that model that is generated, uh, once uh, our tools and our testers have those shared models, we're in a much better position to make better informed choices of our uh, test cases to run, but also we can let the do tools do what they're good at and generate paths of interest. And there's a lot of information based in our previous test logs, in our defect reports, in our production data, in our production logs, that can influence a better selection and choice of test cases for, in particular, regression testing. So I kind of uh, look at tools in two dimensions in terms of their capability. There's the ability to capture knowledge, that is the record keeping, let's say, and the other one is the ability to investigate. And uh, there's other ways of looking at tools and technology, but this helps my story, if you like, and that's why I use this kind of angle. So of course, there's a four quadrant model. So I'm looking at the range of capabilities, the ability to investigate running along the X axis, the horizontal, and the ability to capture knowledge, the vertical. And you can see that all the tools that I could think of, and there's probably a lot more I'm sure I could, I could think of, but I wanna make a point here, that we have tools which help us to capture knowledge, to help us to capture models, if you like. But we do not have tools. We don't have any tools that are really sophisticated yet in the ability to uh, investigate where we can hand over the exploration activity of testing to tools. We can't do that yet. They are very, very immature in that respect, if not uh, non-existent. Um, and I have to say on the left hand side in the middle, you can say pencil and paper and sketching tools. You know, um, These are very sophisticated in terms of what we can do with them in terms of capturing knowledge but they're not digital. So we don't get the data. We can't give that data to a tool. So uh, pencil and paper, you know, is the primary uh, tool of most exploratory testers, absolutely. Um, but we need to get better. We need to get better and certainly move to the right as well, as well as moving north uh, towards more sophisticated modeling tools. So that's how I look at these things. And along the short of it from the tool vendor's perspective is, um, I think the tool vendors have recognized uh, that actually test execution engines are now commodities. Um, and you know, the, the example of Selenium, for example, in very wide set spread, re spread use, it's an open source tool. So, you know, uh, these test execution engines, I think, uh, can be replaced by open source and free, free utilities, let's say. The real value to testers is uh, stuff that helps us to capture knowledge, that is the model capture, to do test design and selection for execution. Uh, test data management is a massive challenge in environments that have lots of data in particular. And I, wanna, I want to move much more towards uh, survey support, exploratory, exploration support, if you like. Uh, I'm gonna use the word survey uh, in, a, in a moment or two, just to, because I, I think that's a better metaphor. And needless to say, frameworks are widespread too, but I mean, we need to get better at frameworks, needless to say. 
And I think machine learning and AI will uh, bring benefits if we can capture the knowledge of testers in some model-based format. So I want to talk briefly about integration, which is often misunderstood, because I think, I think this is relevant to another model I'm going to show you. So um, if you like, integration starts with the second line of code. We have to integrate line two of code with line one. Every developer knows that they spend most of their time trying to synchronize their software to do uh, the tasks that, that's been commissioned. And integration does not end until we integrate the system of systems, perhaps, in a, on a large uh, environment, to the business process. So uh, integration never stops, never ends. It's all pervasive. It's everywhere. We should not think of integration as two stages, a technical integration and then a, a business integration at the end. And I want to just uh, illustrate that with terms of the viewpoint of our developers who look at the software system as a center of their universe, as the scope of their universe, and our business users who look at the broader context, which is other systems and the business context itself, the business processes and activities in uh, internally and externally to partners and customers and suppliers and so on. So uh, we have these kind of two perspectives. And I want to just, uh, just use this kind of idea to show you another model, another way of looking at testing. I'm going to operate on two dimensions, needless to say. Um, I've got uh, component integration, integration in the small, if you like, where we're technically integrating uh, component to component or system to system. And on the right, we've got systems in context, systems being integrated, if you like, with the uh, business process itself. Uh, at the top, I'm going to use two, two terms which are kind of um, derived from ancient history, validation and verification. I'm not going to dwell on these except to say that they are well understood in some aspects of our industry, but not widely used anymore. But I thought they were relevant. But I'm going to refine my uh, labels and talk about from the left, we've got system flows. That is, we look at the system from a point of view of flows through the software, the system itself. Whereas on the right, we're looking at business flows. We're looking at user journeys, that kind of style of procedure to follow when we create tests. And from the perspective of data, we have, you know, going north to realistic data, business and production data, maybe. And at the bottom, we've got synthetic data. So what I want to suggest is that, that there are four stages, uh, not, I don't mean in a waterfall kind of sense, but in a four types, four categories of, of, of integration happening in the very small top left, uh, in the large bottom left. On the right, we're doing system to system integration, you know, in the very large. And then at the top right, we're doing business integration testing. That is between uh, our system of systems and our business. And I, we can label this with perhaps the levels or the degrees of automation and manual testing within each. Uh, and I'm not trying to profess, you know, uh, uh, you know, wisdom in this area, except I want to suggest that the the range of, of, of automation varies across the four areas, and it might be helpful to think in terms of realism of data versus synthetic data, realism of business flows, transactions, and uh, system flows, you know, more artificial or synthetic approaches. Um, and by and large, we're looking at realism uh, evolving from bottom left to top right. Now, I think it's relevant to the machine learning and AI discussion because AI typically will be looking more at production data than synthetic data for test cases. So it's helpful to consider that realism actually is a is a, a thing that we don't do enough of in our testing, you could argue. So very briefly, I've got about two minutes to talk about future tools. Uh, here's my thesis that we know uh, an awful lot about structured stage testing. We know an awful lot about exploratory testing nowadays. There are attributes of both that are very positive. But there are also attributes of the, of the um, two styles, if you like, or uh, approaches to, to test execution in particular, that are less positive. And there are critics and advocates of both sides of the argument. I'm not going to get into uh, whether who is right and who is wrong, and I'm not going to def defend what I've put up on the screen. Perceptions vary depending on who you talk to. But what I want to suggest is that the best of both worlds are what we need in order to make progress with machine learning and AI. We need the systematic um, 
if you like, a data-driven approach on the left, you know, the waterfall and structured side, we need to cap do good record keeping in order to capture the data for our tools to support our exploratory activity on the right. So uh, exploration support is, is really what I want tools to do is to, as I explore the system under test, I want a tool to be capturing every button click and mouse movement and uh, uh, data entry and where I want to check some, and that's some kind of outcome, I want that captured. I want it captured by the tool in real time as I explore so that the tool is building up a picture of the system under test and building behind the scenes a model of that system under test and building, uh, if you like, a collection of paths potential navigation paths through the system at a high level, but also at a low level. And I want to use a surveying metaphor, a bit like surveying the streets of a town to create a map of the territory. You know, the, the system model emerges from our day-to-day -day exploration activities. Our captured paths through that model become potential um, test paths, but also automated test paths. So. The information required for scripting is available in the model as I capture it. So I'm not suggesting we take a, a complete system and then build a model uh, as a stage in our test process. As we explore the system day to day, this is where we capture the model as an as a emergent property of our system. So I want to suggest that the way we should look at test automation is humans make the early maps and tools follow the trails that we map. Okay. So in the same way that developers have um, integrated development environments or interactive development environments, IDEs, I want an interactive test environment. And if you like, I want a tool that has, let's say, four modes of operation. One is survey mode. It captures the model as I navigate through paths in the system. It's a bit like the old capture replay idea, but uh, we know that... Um, what we're not capturing is code so much as the model in a format that is reusable by tools and by our testers. I want to be able to uh, dig into the model and dig deep into the model to look at uh, variations and uh, uh, alternative paths. And I want the tool to, to make suggestions to me to, to come up with uh, test values for fields that it recognises on screen, say. Um, I wanted also to give me examples of test data from production systems because the tool should have access to the backend data and transactions in our production uh, database. I want uh, an interactive test mode where I can step through tests line by line, if you like, a bit like a debugger, but it's a bit more sophisticated than a debugger because if you like what I'm doing, I'm running the test under supervision and I can observe the behavior of the system under test as a human uh, brings value to those activities. But the tool acts as a proxy between the human and the machine. So the tool captures everything the tester does. So uh, it should be uh, seamless in, in terms of its operation, but that's what I want the tools to do. And then I want to run tests unattended, of course, as, as per usual. So testing and automation becomes a modeling problem, not a scripting programming problem. And for years, we've, we've heard of uh, uh, codeless uh, test automation. Well, that's a nice idea, but we need, we need to go beyond that. What I want to talk about is this concept of moving from passive collaboration to active collaboration. The tester has a big contribution to make in the early days of our projects in, in uh, evaluating requirements, exploring, challenging, and correcting and improving our environments, our requirements. Um, we need to uh, look cl more closely at how we explore systems for the purpose of testing and you have tools which will build models that we can uh, derive tests from. So I want to use this idea of a surveying metaphor uh, in an interactive test environment. And once the, the model is available and the tools, machine learning and AI have the data to uh, make uh, suggestions and to make choices, to offer choices, we have a much more powerful uh, kind of metaphor for testing, uh, much more in control of matters and also much more powerful. Uh, so I want to suggest that um, the opportunity for testers is to have uh, more sophisticated tools under our control to make choices and to advance the state of the art. Thank you.